Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass. And today with me is Russ Bates, CEO of Next Energy. Russ, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. Great to be here. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, as we start every show, I have an unfair advantage over the audience at this point is I have some idea of who you are from both the pre-show and the background we have. Why did you start by giving the audience a little professional uh, background of who you are and why you're on the show? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, Russ Bates of Next Gen Clean Energy Solutions. Um, basically, my background is power generation and primarily fossil fuels, so coal, uh, natural gas, and that was all before I transitioned into clean energy. So uh, now we've got Next Gen Clean Energy Solutions, which provides consultation work, project development, and owner's representation services for clean energy projects with uh, well, several different clients. Um, big, small, um, large corporations, municipalities, um, any and all. So what we're able to do is be a, uh, a one-stop shop, single point of contact, uh, concept to completion uh, solution for these, uh, these organizations um, to transition into clean energy. Now, I've been living in Europe for a few years and coming back to the U U.S. in a few weeks. Um, you described a career journey where you were in more conventional energy production and you've moved to renewables. Um, what about the market? Are, I mean, when I meet many Americans and stuff, not everyone's super excited about the journey to renewables. Um, how, how are you finding that? Well, it's, it really has been a transition that started a long time ago. Um, I'm talking about the industry in general and it continues to this day. Uh, so years ago, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have seen me as a fan of, of renewables, of solar or wind, because uh, it just didn't seem as viable to me then. And as time uh, went on and the, uh, the economic advancements, uh, making more economical and of course the technological advancements, now it, it does make a lot of sense. So that's where you see more people uh, jump on board. And of course the sustainability and the climate issues are part of it, but we look at it from an economic standpoint quite a bit. And so when you say you're a fan, what does that mean the economics had to do to, to catch your attention? How, how did they need to evolve over the past 20 years to make it that a business owner today or a utility today would be talking with you to help help plan for the renewable transition? Oh, that's a, a really good question. Uh, it used to be more of a, a novelty. Um, it did not make economic sense to, to have solar panels on your house or business. Um, it was more of a, a statement, if you will. Um, now that's not the case. Uh, whenever we're talking to the clients, um, the bottom line matters. And, and that's something we, we take very seriously. So, um, you know, the, the advancements in the tech, uh, the uh, production of these um, uh, clean energy technologies has made a huge difference. And uh, people are, are seeing that and making that change, not necessarily for the environment. That's a big part of it. Don't get me wrong. But more so, I would say uh, they're looking at the, the dollars they can save. So when, when you're saying it like that, though, so people are people mid-sized companies who, who, who are the target that that's looking to save money that you're, you're looking to work with? What kind of customers? Really? Yeah, really any and everybody. Um, you've got your big corporations that are publicly traded. And of course, um, their shareholder influence on, on making that, uh, that change. But again, they're seeing the, the economic rewards of that. So it's helping the shareholders. Um, you've also got uh, in the supply chain um, that's being driven, whether it's by the SEC, by shareholders or whatever, for those, uh, those organizations to also make that transition. So a lot of motives, it really comes back down to, uh, to the bottom line and, and what savings are they going to be able to have, especially with the, I'll say, really volatile market conditions of uh, 
the utility market. Um, I know here in Northeast Ohio, um, it's going to be quite a, a sticker shock when people get their bills in July um, because of the, the incredible rate increase. Uh, purchase of electricity on the open market um, that they had a, uh, oh, uh, an auction back in October. It went from like 50 something dollars a megawatt hour to around 120. So I'm not saying everybody's bill is going to double, but that's going to go up considerably. And uh, that's going to make a, a big difference on the on the impact. But the individual rate payer that that's regulated, right? Is that so the, 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 ba- the rates can't just go up, right? So how does that work? How does it trickle down to me somewhere in Ohio getting my energy bill? Well, like Ohio's an unregulated state, so it's it's a little bit different. But uh, you have options as far as where you can purchase your electricity. Um, but it's really what's what's the supply and demand. Um, the uh, demand continues to go up every single day. There's there's a lot more cell phones, uh, electric vehicles, things like that, which drives the demand up. Uh, the supply, especially on the utility sl- side, it's it's really going down. We're seeing a lot of these coal plants that uh, are no longer going to be in service after a certain amount of time. Um, I know, too, that I spent a lot of time on whenever I lived in southern Indiana. Uh, they're almost down to nothing. They're down to, uh, I think, two units out of uh, six before. So you, the supply and demand is a big part of it as well. Which now, are there re- renewable, are there renewable um, like are there PV parks or wind parks going up in the same regions that are trying to offset that that? Um coal generation going offline? It, it depends. Um, Ohio, there's some, but Ohio's not a really a, a renewable friendly state. Um, they're not big fans of clean energy, although a lot of developers want to do stuff in, in Ohio. Other states, uh, Texas, th- they've embraced it. Um, they're doing a lot there. Uh, Arizona, Florida, uh, California, uh, but even Illinois. In the Midwest, there's great opportunity. New Hampshire and, and the New England states. Uh, Michigan. Uh, there's there's a lot of them going in, yeah. And then the problem statement you just described, so should individuals and companies be worried about continuity of their electric, electricity, or is it just a cost concern? What is, is that, you know, we have intermittent renewables, so, and then if you're having baseload systems maybe going down, is there concern already, or should there be concern of continuity of service? Uh, I think that's definitely if you're just tied to the grid, that's that's a concern with uh, brownouts, blackouts and things like that that are becoming more prevalent um, with renewables. Yeah, they are intermittent. So you have to either have that uh, storage uh, component in place, which uh, can make sense or maybe it doesn't. It's it's all depends on each individual uh, uh, situation. Um, but you've also got uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to say the, the grid upgrades that, that are a problem. The grid modernization is is not really in place, so that means it's tougher for these renewables to get online to provide that additional power. But even with uh, you know clean energy, say you put a solar array um, on your roof at your manufacturing facility or at your house, you're still going to be tied into the grid more than likely. You're not going to be an island, so you still got that energy that you can use from the grid. Now, you, in your intro, you said that you advise or help customers. So, so what are you helping them with in this situation? So what's the problem statement they're bringing to you and what, what's the solution, right? So you said you're a proponent of renewables because they're cost effective is what I heard you say. Um, you mentioned that, you know, there's going to be a number of people, at least in Ohio, surprised by the cost of energy because of some spikes that took place for the rate per megawatt hour. Uh, so, so what is it they're coming to you for? What are they looking to solve? Um, it could be a combination of things. It could be one thing. Um, we work with some large uh, global corporations and they have sustainability initiatives they want to accomplish. Um, so they'll put together a, a plan of, uh, let's say, goals. They want to have a GHG, the, the greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030 or 2035 or whatever their, their particular goals are, but they don't know exactly how to get there. What's that mean? OK, we need to do something. What is that? And they're really looking at it from uh, probably around a 50,000 foot view where we can get ground level and actually uh, detail the plan and and put together the pricing, bring everything together. Um, We don't do installation work. That's not what we're about. But we do put things out for competitive bids. So we'll work with an incredible number of partners, um, our engineering procurement construction partners to do that work. So we'll put it out for competitive bid, get the best fit for them. And then uh, be that owner's rep and project manage for that that client. So 
it's really turnkey. They can turn to us and say, here's what we, we need. Okay, here's, here's some options. Here's some different solutions, and we'll handle it. Uh, they can be as involved as they want to be, but they really don't have to be. Um, we can send them reports. We can take them on, uh, on uh, job site walks, things like that. It's really whatever they're, they're interested in. And so for a project like that, are you building the performer out or are they already performing out that they know that they want to go to renewables before they come to you? Is that the problem statement or is it just they want more predictable energy costs into the future so that it's better for their bottom line? What What's driving them to come talk to you besides the ESG angle? Uh, it's it's the bottom line is a, a big, big component of it. So they, they have an idea. They don't know, all right, is this going to be cost effective or is it not? And it really varies in whatever region of the country that you're in. Um, what are the rates? What's the, uh, the anticipated escalation? Um, what type of system is going to go in? Is it, is it a solar? Is it a micro wind turbine system? Is it a combination of both? Um, and what do those financials look like? So we'll put together a preliminary design and what we call a budgetary financial proposal to give them an idea. Here's, here's what it, it's probably going to look like and run through that with them. If they like that, then we move on to the next step, which is a limited notice to proceed. That's where we go out for the competitive bids and get the firm numbers based on that. Does this plan work with assets? If, if a company's in rental space or industrial space they don't own, how, how do you handle a situation like that? So you know, you're making a, a bet on renewables with a long-term asset you're putting in to generate. How does something like that work, play out? That's another really good question because a lot of people do lease um, warehouse space or their manufacturing facility or, or office space or whatever. And what we've found is that we can work with our, um, with their owner, uh, the owner of the property and show them, Hey, you might want to invest in this instead of your tenant purchasing electricity from the utility. Why not just purchase it from you? And by the way, here's your, the incentives that come with that. Here's the, the projected uh, income that you'll get from that. Um, really a turnkey type of thing. So it, it solves a, a few problems, gives another revenue stream to the, uh, the property owner uh, that more than likely they weren't even aware of. So it can work like that. We've worked other deals where um, the, the tenant will go ahead and put that system in. They'll own it, maintain it, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, the property owner works something out with them in that regard. So there's there's a lot of different ways to put it together. Have you seen a REIT or someone? I mean, a lot of the industrial properties, there's a couple of larger REITs that own the properties. You know, a lot of places in North America. Are they embracing this technology? And have you already seen them buy into this at scale? We're starting to. Um, it's it's that goes back to that transition piece of. Whenever you're a property owner, you're not thinking about being a, an electricity provider, right? You're thinking about the actual real estate. And people are starting to, to open their eyes and say, hey, here's, again, another revenue stream. Uh, people are investing in this for a lot of reasons. Why don't I do that? How, how come I don't go ahead and have that, uh, that additional revenue stream in place? Plus, it's, it's more attractive to the uh, uh, tenants, prospective tenants that have these ESG goals that want to uh, pay a little bit less for their electricity and know what that electricity is going to cost them over a, you know extended period of time as opposed to maybe month to month. So in, in most cases, in my experience in the business world, there, there, there's kind of some low-hanging fruit, right? So, so in this case, are there certain industries that are energy intense or that make more sense to rapidly go absorb this kind of technology today? than perhaps others. So, you know, if you had a sales force at NextGen and you were trying to reach out to prospective customers, what's the ideal customer or the ideal company that would get the most return on, on, on this kind of infrastructure being in place? I, I would say manufacturing that uses uh, a lot of electricity for, for their process. Um, and on top of that, I would say a, a facility that has a nice, large, um, in great condition, uh, roof. So uh, a roof uh, mount system, and I'm, I'm talking solar at this point, because uh, it's the most popular, but a roof uh, mount is the most economical for the most part, just, you know, and speaking in rule of thumb type of uh, terminology. Uh, but if you're using a, a ton of electricity at your manufacturing facility or any facility, uh, for that matter, uh, you're probably a pretty good candidate to at least get a, a free consult and see what that might turn into. Now, you, you talked about the panels of the PV connections up top. 
Uh, are you putting storage in as most of these at this point? Do you have battery or some sort of uh, storage component to most of these installations that you're doing? Yes, we offer solar, um, micro wind turbine, battery storage, EV charging, so, uh, solar uh, lighting, smart poles, which is, is part of that parking lot or roadway lighting as well. That does a lot of stuff. But uh, regarding storage, you really aren't seeing a lot of that. Um, it needs to pencil out. It needs to make sense. So with net metering, right now that makes a lot of sense. As the battery technology improves and the cost goes down, uh, you're going to see more and more of it. Um, but we, we really don't recommend a ton of battery storage uh, unless the situation is, is right. So then you're relying on the, the utility to be your backup if you're if yeah. you battery in, right? So, so when the sun is shining, you're, you're getting plenty of energy. When there's an event that keeps the sun from shining or nighttime, you're, you're relying on the grid. Is that yeah, yeah, that's been the most economical approach uh, thus far for most of our clients. Um, battery storage certainly plays a role, and as we see the the pricing um, continue to improve, we'll we'll probably recommend that a lot more. It, it just depends on what your price per kilowatt hour is. You know, if you're if you're uh, have a low kilowatt hour uh, cost, uh, battery storage probably isn't going to pencil out as much. But like Northeast Ohio, as I mentioned before. Battery storage is probably going to be uh, something people really want to consider. Um, and, and we're saying this in, in the thought of uh, blackouts, brownouts. We, it depends on if you get that. We don't experience a lot here in Ohio, but if you go to other places, parts of the country, which we're a, a national uh, a company, you'll see more and more of that where peace of mind and, and loss production um, that battery storage can prevent really does make it a, a big difference. How far away are we from seeing industrial sites not having big diesel generators outside as their backup? Do you see that as a reality? Do you think these electrical systems are at the point now where you could use battery, use solar, maybe a combination of wind, and get rid of having that huge diesel generator sitting, you know, sitting outside the door there? Or do you see folks still having that as well as this technology? I don't see it going away tomorrow. Um, I always tell everybody this is a transition. Uh, and even if you could snap your fingers and get rid of all the coal plants and, and uh, you know, natural gas um, combined cycle power gen stations, we shouldn't do that. That would, uh, that would cause a lot more problems. It, it needs to be a planned type of uh, transition, which I, I think we've kind of got that plan. I wouldn't say it's all written down. It just depends on who you talk to. Um, but yeah, I, to answer your question, I think you're still going to see that for the foreseeable future, but I, I believe it will eventually go away as part of, uh, this overall transition. Yes. And then like recs or certificates, how big of role do they play to your customers? Are they, are they taking the recs directly on or is the provider taking the recs? Where, where are those going and how important is that to this penciling out? It, it varies. I mean, Rex, uh, those are commodities, right? So it's supply and demand and what's out there. Um, it, it just varies uh, from client to client. So we'll recommend those uh, at times. Usually it's a temporary solution until we get, uh, you know, more power generation as far as clean energy at their facility or, or what have you. Um, but it, it is part of it. I think it's an important part of, of uh, what's going on. Um, I don't think it's the silver bullet that uh, some people may want it to be as, as much as that would be great. And is, is the greatest savings producing the energy or is it the ability to peak shape um, with these kind of installations? I would say, again, it probably depends on the, on the client and where they're at, but uh, either one is, is a great thing. Um, I would say in most of the clients that we've talked to, it's not been so much the, the peak shaving, it's been more of the the bottom line uh, reduction of uh, utility costs, but peak shaving certainly is is important. Um, you want to consider that as well. And then the, the base load of the utility energy, are you monitoring how green that is and are your customers pressuring the utility to be delivering green energy or some percentage of green energy um, and moving away from coal plants or you know gas turbines or something of that nature? Is there pressure on the utility market from your users? There is, um, but remember the, the utility is a monopoly, so they really don't have to, to listen. Um, it's, uh, I would like to say that uh, they want to make this transition, but I, I've really not seen a whole lot of it. There's some that 
are pretty active. Um, but I would say in general, uh, the utility industry has, has kind of balked and, and uh, slow walked and, and can kicked a bit as far as the, this, this transition. And, and along those lines, I, I have heard feedback from folks that getting permitting and putting this in and working with the utility individually can be quite burdensome to get the utility to accept these kind of installations. So what's your experience there maybe, and it's probably relevant to the region or state that you may be in, but what kind of pushback are you getting from the utilities when you want to do all this work to help the customers? Um, I'd say burdensome is being very kind. Um, when you think about it from uh, the utility point of view, which I always try to see both points of view uh, and, and understand, um, but as soon as they hook up that, that clean energy generation system, uh, they're losing money, right? They're, they're not uh, going to get anything for that. So the longer they can hold off from connecting that system, uh, the better uh, as far as them and their shareholders. Um, whenever I look at it, it's very frustrating, honestly, because um, they do have to, to do their due diligence and make sure that their equipment will be able to handle whatever is put back on the grid when you're talking about transformers and things like that. Um, so that's always their, their fallback. But, you know, you may put in, uh, in the design a, a two megawatt system and, and they'll come back and say, no, you can only put in um, a 750 kW system. Um, they, all right, is that real? Is it not? Uh, who knows? It's, it's definitely a monopolistic um, type of, of uh, environment which really I think has to have some, some incredible, uh, I hate to say the word regulation, um, but it, it needs, uh, it definitely needs something. Somebody needs to be watching and, and paying attention to what's going on there. But isn't there an opportunity to actually help with the utility? So for example, if I suddenly want to have fleet charging at my, my warehouse facility and the substation can't handle that, there's a bunch of infrastructure that the utility would need to put in place uh, whereas if you put a microgrid there, you may be able to help me out deliver this much quicker than utility. So is, are there times when, when they see the value of someone like you or someone like your customers putting infrastructure in place, they don't have to go build right now. I mean, cause I, I don't know they could build all the substations that they may need if, if everything electrifies. Uh, you're hundred percent right, Chris. And, and you would think, um, they would, the, the real world that, uh, we've been living in right now, they, they honestly have not, um, we, if I was a utility, because I've worked in the utilities as far as coal plants, natural gas, all of this, there's a tremendous amount of uh, cost that goes with that. Not just the initial build, but the, the operation, the maintenance and things. If I was a utility and, and being able to take advantage of uh, someone else developing these clean energy projects and doing the, the operation and maintenance, and I just buy that energy and get a, a good deal on it, and I just maintain transmission distribution lines, Sounds like a pretty good business model to me, um, but they have not embraced that. I, I'm not saying everybody, every utility's not embraced it, but for the most part, they have not. This is a common conversation with a lot of my colleagues of why aren't they, why aren't they jumping in this? It, it makes so much sense. Uh, they're, they're just not at this point. And they and may say base load power. Across, they may say this or that. North and, American footprint. You, you work across all the U.S., right? You're in every state. You, you feel that's pretty Yes. Important. Yes. Yeah. And then, okay, so I, I get that now. Are your customers generally, I'm not trying to play 20 questions, you're just trying to figure out the, the piece. You're, you're, are your customers selling their surplus energy back to get their costs down? Or are they using all that they generate and that the, the grid is just additional capacity? Yeah, it, mostly it's net metering. So any excess that's generated will go back on the grid and they'll get that credit. Um, it, it depends on the system size. Sometimes a, a system, they'll... They'll use 100% of what's generated because it's just that certain size and they have that much uh, consumption that they need. So, again, um, it, it really depends on on the uh, client. But for the most part, it's it's net metering that goes back and then they, they bank those kilowatt hours. And is the software in place to make that easy for customers today to do that? I mean, I've heard a lot of business plans, a lot of folks doing this kind of management for enterprises. Um how easy is it for, you know, if, if I'm in the manufacturing business, I don't want to be in the energy business because that's not my core competence. So how easy is all this to manage and just get a bill and, and just put my cost structure together? Is that something we can do or do I need to hire someone that's a renewable professional that's now on my staff to manage my future electric needs if, if that's a big part of my manufacturing? 
Yeah, that another great question, Chris. And no, you don't have to hire somebody. Once once the system is in, it's it's taken care of. And you can have someone else do that operation and maintenance for you, um, which is very negligible, especially in the beginning. Um, with solar arrays, you're going to have to to change out those um, inverters whenever they go out. And that could be 10 years. On average, it's 15 years. Um, and, and that's not a big deal. And, and we handle a lot of that with our partners. Um, that's the, the great thing about NextGen. It's a one-stop shop. You know, they can call us and we'll handle all of that. And we do with a lot of things. Uh, so mostly what they see is if we decide to, if they want to see what the system's producing, we can put a, you know, uh, the system in place where they can watch what they're producing and things like that. But usually it's, once it's in, it's really like dealing with their, their utility. Um, they just get a, a bill for whatever, um, from the utility and, and they'll see the savings that they get from that, uh, that clean energy system that's been installed. So really user-friendly and, and not a lot that they have to do. Are you competing generally then with solutions for folks that want to come in and offer a managed service for this then? Is that kind of who your greatest competition is as you're working in this field? Um, for us, I would say we don't have a, a ton of competition. Um, we're pretty unique. Uh, we've been around for like I don't know, two and a half years now, I think. Um, and nobody's really copied us yet as far as what we do. Um, remember, there's a lot of solar companies. There's micro wind turbines, uh, EV charging, things like that. Uh, but they're going in and talking to, to clients with blinders on, so to speak. So they're just looking at solar or battery storage or whatever. We go in um, and we put that uh, that owner's hat on and what's going to be best for us. If we're if we're the owner, we have this property, we have this facility, we have this company, whatever. What's going to be best in not only the short term, but the long term? Maybe it's solar, maybe it's wind, maybe it's a combination of this and this and this. Um, but sometimes it's, we'll recommend not to do anything at a certain point in time. Um, let's say their, their roof's not in the best shape. They're going to have to replace it in the next, you know, five years. Let's, let's not put a system up there yet. Let's make sure we can do it in conjunction with your roof. So we're not having to do a bunch of double work. Um, it's cost us some business, but we think that's the right thing because in long term, we, we've got those long-term relationships and that's what we're, we're building this company on. So are these customers uh, also doing hedging and trading to to optimize their experience or are they just a consumer? Are like are they seeing a point where they now can start doing some risk reduction through you know through through trading markets? Not so much. I, I think you hit it on the head before. They're they're really looking at their core business, which is whatever manufacturing or if it's a warehouse or whatever. And they're not really wanting to get into that. Um, so with, with like um, uh, ITC credits, for example, if they don't want to use that to offset their, their tax burden and they'd rather sell them, we can help with that. But that's like one transaction as far as uh, trying to get on the market and do anything. Nah, for the most part, not. And if they were, we're able to help them with that as well. And when they put one of these projects in, are they financed kind of like a PPA where I, I now have a controlled rate? Or is it simply just the sunk cost of the solar arrays that I'm putting in and the connectivity they put in for the project? And I'm just cost averaging that as long as the life of the asset exists or how, how am I figuring out my cost of energy going forward when, you know, I put so a large warehouse or a large production plant and, you know, you, you come in, you guys put solar panels across the entire operation. I've got plenty of power coming in. How am I figuring out the future value three, five, seven years from now? What am I going to pay? Oh, we'll lay it out uh, however they want. So if, if they want to own the system, we'll usually put a 30 year lifespan on that. And, and that's being a bit conservative because these things will go 35, 40 years. Depends on who you talk to. Some will say 50 years, but we, we're conservative. We'll say it's going to be a 30 year system um, and, and then we'll lay it out. We'll do, get an escalation um, estimate of, of what the utility is going to be doing. We'll put all the operation maintenance, all that kind of stuff in there for, for the full term. And they'll see that. And, and same thing with a, a power purchase agreement. They're going to be able to see all that. If they want to go with a financing option, um, a traditional financing from a bank, certainly that's not a problem. And we can lay out all those projections on the financial end. Um, and then a C-PACE loan, commercial property assessed clean energy loan, we can help them with that. We've got all the people uh, and relationships in place to, to bring that to them. So depending on what they want, we can lay that out. And then program-wise, you just talked about the loan program. Um, you know, so I imagine there's both state and federal incentives for a business to do this. Um, what kind of incentives are currently in place for this, for, for, you know, a mid-sized business looking to do this kind of thing? 
we we focus really on the federal incentives. So with the the IRA that was passed last year and those uh, those incentives, which some were in place and they've just adjusted them a, a bit. Uh, the, those ITC incentives, um, typically you look at 30 percent, um, depends on the project and you have to, to put the project in a certain way to to uh, be able to get that. Uh, and then there's also other incentives, domestic content, you can get an additional 10 percent. Um, there's some brownfield site uh, incentives as well for former coal and um, oil and those types of, of uh, locations. Um, state, it's just going to vary on, on where it's at. So like in Ohio, uh, they're not going to give you anything. But you do have those federal incentives that you, you can take advantage of, and we help in that regard too. Now, you mentioned the supply chain, and I think one of the incentives you said, so are all the resources then to be sourced from within the U.S. to get that advantage of one of the programs there, or is it partially? What, how does that work? What? Well, they don't really know yet. Um, so the, the IRS put out some guidelines um, in May, and everybody had been waiting on these guidelines to come out. And whenever you read them, uh, you could tell the IRS wrote them because it really didn't lay it out very clearly. It, it was uh, more muddy than ever. Um, so we're waiting on guidelines for the guidelines to say, but yeah, um, there's certain things like steel has to be hundred percent sourced here in the U S right. So that's pretty clear, but what does 40% um, uh, content mean to, to reach that? We're not sure does assembled and uh, things from Southeast Asia count uh, as that uh, they don't really know, uh, there's different articles. The New York Times will put something out and it'll contradict what another uh, publication has put out. So I've talked with several renewable energy attorneys who are way smarter than me and they're scratching their head on it, Chris, because they're not sure. So I, 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 everybody wants an answer. I wish I could give you a clear answer, but I, I just don't know. And, and most people don't. All right. So the professionals don't know where that's going yet. The intent is some percentage needs to be onshored but the definition isn't clear. So it's, it's hard to get a good feel of what that's going to be quite yet. Yeah, because the supply chain doesn't exist for a lot of these things. So like the wafers, cells, things like that, um, that you use in, in uh, solar panels. I mean, that's, that's not here in the U.S. Most everything is Southeast Asia. That's, that's where it's, it's been offsourced for a long, long time. So I agree their domestic content is very, very important. Um, but they really, in my opinion, and Joe or nobody Congress called and asked for, for my opinion, but I'll give it here. If they would phase this in and instead have, all right, if your, your panels are assembled in the U S um, that's great for so many years to allow that, allow that supply chain to build up and then be pulling more and more um, from within the U S to meet that domestic uh, requirement. Um, is it 40%? Is it 80%? I don't know, but right now, nobody, I believe is really going to be able to take advantage of that domestic content. Uh, the way the way a lot of people are interpreting it right now but i have to assume since you're already in business for a few years that it still pencils out even without that incentive for for most of your customers yeah yeah it, it really does and if it doesn't i mean we'll show them um you know it's it's right there in black and white i mean it's all numbers is it going to make sense or is it not so but yeah for the most part it's without the 10 percent domestic content you're still going to pencil out not as quickly to have that ROI as with that 10% domestic content, but you're still going to be over the long term uh, saving quite a bit of money, uh, depending on where you're at and what you're paying now and, and things like that. So there's no real cookie cutter, but overall, I'm going to say 85, 90% of the, the clients we work with, um, probably higher than that, honestly, Chris, they're, they're going to save money over the long term. And then with the past few years, there's been some supply chain hiccups or bumps in the road. Uh, are we through that yet? Are we at a point where if you do projects that they're going to be on time and on schedule because of supply chain? Is, is it, are you capable to get all the elements you need to make a successful project in a timely fashion? Or are you still waiting on parts? Um, it, it really depends. Um, right now, at this point in time, yeah, you're, you're in decent shape. Um, it, that could change any any minute. It depends. Uh, I, I know there's um, some oh uh, with the the solar panels coming from Southeast Asia. Those panels in general, uh, they wanted to put the tariffs back on, and you know it was vetoed by Biden. But that veto could be overridden. That's still something people are thinking about. So that changes how things are penciled. Um, 
you know, the, the supply chain is a big reason we started Tri-Sun Solar, which we'll start producing next, uh, next year, 2024, uh, in Q1, is to have domestically manufactured panels with as much U.S. content as possible here in the States that you don't have to worry about your panels being stuck in port somewhere, um, slowing down your project. I, I can tell you, Chris, uh, I've been associated with two projects, uh, big warehouse projects, uh, Amazon actually, that they uh, they had to pretty much shut down because they didn't have panels. Everything was ready. They just need to put the panels in and, and couldn't get them. So that's a huge problem for sure. And then the, the second element, I kind of wonder with the greening um, going on at the pace it's going on, um, skilled labor to be installers for those panels or people doing the software to get it running or, you know, everything from the electrical work to the physical installation. Um, how are we doing with, with that workforce? Is, is it available in most markets and are we going to need more? Uh, to answer your last question. Yeah, we're going to need a lot more. Um, there's, uh, it, it depends which region you're at. Some regions are doing a little bit better than others. Um, but I, I would say that kind of ties in with uh, the fossil fuel transition. Um, I came from that that region, right, from that sector of the economy of fossil fuels. And um, there's a lot of skilled workers there. And as these fossil fuel uh, uh, sectors uh, start receding, that's a great opportunity to transition into clean energy because we need those skilled workers. And I tell people all the time, if I can make that transition, anybody can because I'm, I'm not that special. There's some really skilled people out there that can do that. Um, and, and then we, we need some others um, that you, you don't have to be a master electrician to come in and do this work, right? Um, from frame assembly to, to uh, installing panels to a lot of these other things that um, they're skilled, but they're, they're not as skilled as, say, uh, terminating uh, all the cabling, you know, hooking up all the wiring, so to speak. So, but is that a high enough paying livable wage if, if I'm putting frames up and I mean, up on the rooftops of warehousing, uh, especially in sunny areas where you might want to do it doesn't sound compelling. Um, it sounds one step removed from roofer, which, you know, may pay well or may not. Is, is this a, a high paid or high enough paying career to convert? Right. So if you looked at the gas and non-traditional. So when fracking and all the things were going on, a lot of people went into that because they came from markets where they could make a livable wage. So mm -hmm. is being an installer going to be a livable wage? Yeah, it is a livable wage. And you got to remember with the Inflation Reduction Act, that 30% ITC that I, I was talking about, there's certain things that you have to to hit. And part of the pay is is with, uh, included in that. So prevailing wage is going to be uh, part of that. Is, is someone who's uh, putting together frames going to make as much as that that master electrician who's who's really doing some technical work? Well, no, but that's throughout the industry. You know, you'll have your apprentices. I, I started off as a pre-apprentice, right? So I was doing some hard physical work um, and not getting paid nearly as much as this guy standing in the cabinet, just, you know, hooking things up. But that's at skill level. So whatever you're doing, and there are people are going to be able to work their way up. And, and some uh, folks are going to be happy, um, you know, assembling frames and putting modules in it all day. Um I was like that uh, for a long time. I'm like, yeah, this is this is good. I think about whatever and, and uh, put these things in and go. Um, it's just going to vary. But to answer your question, yeah, it's going to be a, a livable wage. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, you got to pay these guys and um, guys and girls that are doing these things. And it, it's got to be something that they can live on. So very, very important. And I think the IRA uh, adjusts or addresses that. And, and go back to the first part of the question. So if you do, let's say you have multiple state projects running at the same time right now, are you having trouble stopping them or is, is it going okay right now that there's, there's enough capacity to, to deploy the project? So, you know, we've talked about supply chain. Now we're talking about the humans element to that. Um, yeah. Is that there today? It, it is right now. We haven't really seen too many problems with it. it there's, there's places where you're going to be running low here or there. Um, and, and what we do is next gen. So these EPCs handle the manpower, but what we're able to do is help them with that. So we have a lot of connections and relationships, whether it's with union, uh, union halls or whether it's with other um, hiring uh, firms to be able to help in that regard. So it, it just varies. But right now, um, for the most part, they've got enough people 
but we know that's going to change. Um, that's going to change a lot, especially when you think about the interconnection part of this and, and tying in uh, with like a PJM and, and these different grid operators. Um, once those get better and you have more of these big projects, you're going to need a lot more people. So there's lots of stuff in the queue that's that's not going because you don't have uh, have that interconnection. Thus, you don't need the people, supply chain, all of that kind of stuff. The, I look for that to change. And when it does, that's where that's where you're really going to see some shortages with with labor. Well, as we're running up the time, I guess, you know, if you take out your crystal ball and tell me where this is going. So, you know, you, you've talked about a pretty positive outlook. You, you, you seem to think the, the market is ripe. There seems to be a lot of activity. You, you can see demand coming. What changes over the next two or three years that, that are going to be remarkable enough that, that the average American might notice? Um, I, I think supply chain, as far as the domestic supply chain um, and manufacturing for the, the parts, the raw materials that we don't um, have right now that we get out of Southeast Asia, I think that's going to be a big thing that we see in the next several years. And that'll kind of cascade into the domestic content and manufacturing. Um, you know, I mentioned Tri-Sun Solar earlier. There's, there's others that are getting into that. Um, when you think of raw materials like glass, uh, the, the wafers, the cells, all this, that's going to create a lot of jobs, um, and it's going to be right here in the, in the states. So that's one thing. Um, I, I think as time goes on, you're going to see uh, a lot more of these um, corporations um, and that supply chain up and down for just your everyday stuff transitioning more and more um, to meet either ESG goals or, in my case, I, I think what they're going to see is the economic improvement that they're going to have on that bottom line by making this this adjustment. So. I see really, really great things for this industry for the foreseeable future. And are, are you having to show providence of those electrons, where they come from? Are, are people already forcing you to say, hey, like we're running in this percentage of green? Is that is that part of the plan or is it just straight economics for most? It, it's really um, mostly straight economics right now. Um, now, there's some that it, it's not so much economics they want it to be economically feasible. Um, but if that ROI is, is further out, that's okay with them because they're doing it for, for these initiatives and, and it's okay. And these are pretty profitable companies and, and can afford to do that. Right. So it's, it's a more of a feel good thing, uh, but they are going to save some dollars, uh, down the road. It's just further down the road. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you joining the podcast today. It's been an interesting journey. It's, it's very domestic focus, which is great. We got to see what's happening. Um, any final thoughts as we're signing off? Uh, no, Chris, I just really appreciate uh, you having me here. Um, hopefully uh, people hear this and want to get involved with this this industry because uh, it's a great one and there's a lot of opportunity. So I invite anybody to uh, to uh, join that's, that's even considering it. Check it out. Well, thank you very much. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this episode, enjoyed the content. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe, follow us, look for us on YouTube. Look for us on Facebook, and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.